just the lesson. As I just said, the recording you're going to find on YouTube will be just the lesson. We will continue to broadcast our service in its entirety on the, you, on the Facebook page. So feel free to join us there every Sunday. We hope that each and every one of you are enjoying the study of First Thessalonians as we prepare for a study of Second Thessalonians, as we prepare for a study of the book of Revelations, at least in brief. Uh, we hope that each of you are edified, that you gain something as we study God's word, as you learn what it says there. So in the meantime, let's open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, and we will start in verse 11. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 11. That's not, we're going to get there. The first section of this epistle, the first section of this letter, the first part of this letter, which you have been exposed to already, which we have studied together is known as apostolic reflections. Now, Paul had several things that he commented about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, chapter 2, now we're into chapter 3. He praised their wonderful reception of the gospel. He did that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 1 through 10. He took a look at or reviewed the nature of his ministry while he was among the people of Thessalonica, and he did this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. Paul continued, he expressed his love for them, he expressed his concern for their spiritual condition, he talked about how he was worried about them, and he did that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 17 through chapter 3, verse 10. Now, let's start our reading in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 11. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. May the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. Love, as you can see here, is a mutually beneficial. It is expressed by both parties. It is what's known in English as bilateral, meaning two ways, not unilateral, meaning one way. Verse 13, may he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy one. Now, you're going to notice that this prayer followed a very similar pattern throughout many of Paul's letters. Leave your bookmark in 1 Thessalonians and go to Philippians chapter 1 and verse 9. Philippians chapter 1 verse 9. I'll give you a second to get there. First Philippians chapter 1, verse 9, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, verse 10, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Okay, that's Philippians. Now go to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. Philippians, go to the right. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God <coughs> to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, verse 11, 
being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you have great endurance and patience. Verse 12, and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. Now, we're in Thessalonians, but we've also looked at Philippians and Colossians. And in the, all of these letters, in all of these books, in the passages that we just read, Paul expresses his desire for his brethren and what he wants for them. Now, when we consider these prayers, it is helpful to remember that Paul wrote by inspiration. Inspiration, theophustos, meaning God breathed. So he's not just expressing his own desires, but those of God as well. So it's not just Paul's desires, it's God's desires. And in most cases, the prayers that we just looked at apply just as much to us today as they did at the time that they were written and the 1900 years in the meantime. Now, we're going to take a look at this prayer more closely. And we're going to look at several of the elements in Paul's prayer for the Thessalonians. And we're going to consider and ask ourselves, what is God's will for us today? We notice the first thing that we notice about the prayer is how do we direct our prayer? Paul had a desire to see the people, and he expressed this desire in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17. However, in verse 18, it tells us that he had been hindered by God. So Paul prayed to see the people. He was requesting aid from both the Father and Jesus. Note the distinction between the Father and the Son. That makes it difficult for some people who have erroneous beliefs on the Trinity. Go to 2 John chapter 1, verse 9. 2 John chapter 1, verse 9. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teachings of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teachings has both the Father and the Son. The implication, not just of Paul addressing his prayer to the Father and the Son, and the letter from John in 2 John chapter 1, this implies a trinity because there is a distinction between the persons of the Godhead. And it also suggests that separate actions of the Father and Son. Now, there are those who will tell us they're called theist. God wound it all up and he doesn't care. However, we can pay attention to scripture and it tells us that God cares about us. In Paul in Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, he said sin, he had been hindered by Satan. However, he believed that God could overcome the hindrance of Satan's efforts. Peter believed the same thing. Go to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. Verse 10, 
and the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. God could provide safe travel for Paul if it was in accordance with his will. We know that God can do all things that are in, are in keeping with his will and with his nature. God cannot lie. Romans chapter 1, verse 10. Go to Romans chapter 1, verse 10. In my prayers at all times, I pray that now at last by God's will, the way may be opened for me to come to you. So we've looked at Paul's desire to see the people. We're going to see God's desire for us. Go to 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. First John 5, 14. This is the confidence we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. We have to remember what is God's will when we pray. We have to remember what is God's will when we are planning our lives, when we are thinking of what we're going to do, when we plan for our future. Go to James chapter 4 and verse 13. James chapter 4 and verse 13. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow, we will go to this or that city. Spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or do that. Paul, as Paul desired to see his beloved brethren, so we should desire to see our loved ones. Just like this week, we're not able to meet in the church building. We desire to see our brothers and sisters. We should desire. But in our planning and in our prayers to see our brothers, let us not forget the will of God. Now, we have to consider how Paul prayed that the Lord might make the people of Thessalonica increase and abound through the working of God. Our spiritual growth, that's your spiritual growth, that's my spiritual growth, that's all of our spiritual growth, involves the working of God. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Philippians chapter 1. Verse 6. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. We have to turn things over to God, but we have to also extend our own efforts. You're in the book of Philippians. Go to chapter 2, verse 12. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Verse 13. For it is God who works in you, in you to will and act in order to fulfill his purpose. We need to pray to God as if everything depends on him. And we need to work 
like everything depends on us. Paul prayed for the people to in, of Thessalonica to increase and abound. Our spiritual growth should be never ending and it should be always increasing. Go to 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 5. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 5. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness, knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control, perseverance, and to perseverance, godliness, and to godliness, mutual affection, and to mutual affection, love. Verse 8, for if you possess these qualities in increasing measure they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. Let's face some facts. Every day we're alive, we get older. As we get older, our bodies become older, and they slow down, and we become weak. However, our inner person can be renewed every day. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. Second chap- 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. Like the sun rises in the morning to reach its peak in the afternoon, so our spiritual growth should be marked by increasing and abundant progress. How many Christians do you know who once they've reached the state of salvation through the baptism for the remission of sins, put away their Bibles and don't study anymore. How many Christians do you know who've been Christians for 10, 15, 30 years and know nothing more today than they did when they were baptized 30 years ago? Go to Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18. The path of the righteous is like the morning sun, shining ever brighter till the full light of day. It has to continue to grow. Now, Paul prayed that the people in Thessalonica should grow in love for one another and to all other people also. He asked that they grow increasing and abounding in love. Now, this is something that already existed in the Thessalonians. Look at 1 Thessalonians 1.3. This was something that Thessalonians did not really need to be told. Go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9. Now about your love for one another, we do not need to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more. Continue to grow throughout your time. However, we cannot reach a point when we can say we can't grow anymore. There's nothing more for me to learn. Go to Philippians chapter 3, verse 13, and let's start there. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13.
brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God had called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Verse 15, all of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. Just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. Don't point at the people who aren't following God. Point at those who are. Follow the example that the people who are truly setting the path for Christ and follow them. We are to love not just ourselves, not just our brothers within the church, but all men. Look, the truth is it's easy to love our brethren in the church. It's easier to love some of our brethren more than others. But our God tells us to love our enemies. Go to Luke chapter 6, verse 32 and following. Luke chapter 6, verse 32. Turn there, please. Luke 6, 32. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. 34. And if you lend to those from whom you can expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners, expecting to be repaid in full. But love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. It is certainly God's desire for all of his children to abound in love. It should be something the whole world sees in us. And this should be the focus of many of our prayers. We should pray for the ability to love more. We should pray for the ability to love better. Philippians chapter one, verse nine. And this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. And finally, we're going to take a note of Paul's prayers for the Thessalonians that he asked the Lord might establish their hearts blameless in holiness. Go to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, because to be blameless is the very reason that Jesus gave himself for us. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. 26. To make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. We are told that without holiness, we will not see God. Without holiness, we cannot see God. Go to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. 
if without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Now, Jesus makes it possible through his blood, but we have to do our part also. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. Go there. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1. Therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Now there is a time and a place where we're going to need to be perfect. And that is at the coming of Jesus. However, that's the end of the world. We need to be holy and blameless, not just at the end of the world, but at the end of our world. The world may carry on one more day, or 1,000 more years. My world will not. It's entirely possible that today, somebody watching or listening to this video, this may be their last opportunity to respond to the gospel. And if it is, they need to be right with God when that happens. We need to be right when our world comes to play. Now, take note of the following about the Lord's coming. This is the third time in three chapters that Paul refers to the coming of Jesus Christ. He does so in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10. He refers to the second coming in, second Thess in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19. He refers to the return of Christ in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13. Now, there's a word there, saints. And in Greek, that's hagion. And hagion, if you do the word study on it, could refer to angels like it does in Matthew chapter 25, 31. It also could include those who are redeemed as it does in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 14. From Paul's prayer to the Thessalonians, we have seen that it is proper to seek God's providential guidance when we want to see our loved ones. We have seen from Paul's prayer that it is proper for us to pray for one another's spiritual growth and for the Lord's blessing. If we desire to see each other from time to time in this life, it's proper to pray for that. It's proper to pray for our loved ones to increase and grow or abound more in love. It's proper to pray for the people to be blameless in their holiness, to be blameless in the presence of God when Christ returns or you go to Christ. Now, Paul's prayer for the Thessalonians is the type of prayer that we should diligently offer for one another. Christ did his part. We have to do ours. We have to hear the gospel. Romans chapter 10 verse 17 says, consequently faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. You have to hear the word. After you hear the word, you have to believe that it's true. John chapter 20 verse 31 says, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. You have to repent of your sins. Luke chapter 13 and verse 3 tells us, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. 
after we've repented, we have to confess our faith in Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 10, verse 10 says, For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. You have to confess Jesus Christ. You have to be baptized. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21 says, For it is baptism that now saves us, not the washing away of a physical filth, but the approach of a clear conscience towards God. After you're baptized, you have to remain faithful until Jesus comes back or you go to him. Revelations chapter 2 verse 10 tells us, Remain faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. If you are in need of special prayers, if you are in need of anything that this congregation can do for you,